we're just excited to see everybody. So anyway, I'm going to uh, begin by giving you just a little bit of a challenge from God. He showed me a scripture one time when I was really questioning something. He showed me a scripture in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. I always use the New American Standard. And it tells that his protection was waiting to be fully revealed in the end days. Well, the Bible lets us know that since the cross, we've really been in the end days. And I kept saying, Lord, your word says that in the end days now, we're going to be seeing, you know, all these things happening throughout the world. And I look at the world and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. You know, you look and see that. And it certainly doesn't look like the victory that we see here in this protection covenant. And so I got a little bit confused, and I was really questioning God and asking him. Well, the Lord, just a few years ago, he spoke the word remnant to me. And he said that I always work with a remnant because only a remnant is going to grab hold of these promises and put them to work. He said they're available, but only a remnant will take hold of them and really put them to work in, his, in their lives. But he said, for as many as do they're going to see these promises come to pass. That's why I love getting to teach this, to, uh, because I want more and more people to become a part of this remnant. But he showed this covenant to me in a dream, and later he had me put it in book form, and this was right before 9-11, and uh, I, I just felt the urgency to get it into a book. And then all of a sudden we had 9-11, and I thought, okay, I'm beginning to see the urgency. And since then, we've sent thousands and thousands of books, you know, on the Psalm 91 covenant. We've sent them in to missionaries. We've sent them into prisons. We've sent them uh, just literally all over the world, especially to the military. And uh, it's been real fun. I wish I had brought my picture uh, this past trip that we were on. Well, we met a, a young military guy that was going home. And we got a picture with him, and he was, uh, he was excited. He said that his wife, that they knew about the Psalm 91. So that was exciting. And uh, so I've been hearing from Christians literally <clears throat> at home and abroad who have literally grabbed hold of these promises, and uh, they just have unbelievable miracle stories that they're telling us. We love, uh, we get letters and everything, uh, you know, phone calls telling us just wonderful things that God has done. And so... Um, but in spite of all the ones that I had grabbed hold of it, uh, I, I was just really crying out to God. And I said, I realized that the majority of Christians, they've either never heard of this protection <clears throat> or else they just haven't embraced it. They haven't taken it in. But God's word now bears out that this is not always going to be the majority of Christians who, who reach out and grab hold of it. It's kind of like in Noah's day. It was one man and his family, you know. And Gideon's army, he had thousands, and the, the thousands went home with only a 300 left that received it and uh, enjoyed the benefit of the victory. And uh, so he said it's going to be a remnant now each time who experienced the victories. But he said that the promises are there for every single one who will reach out and receive them. And they're available, but we just have to reach out in faith and receive it. Uh, so there may be some really difficult things that we're going to be seeing in the, in the future. But God has offered a protection now, protection covenant, and the remnant who will take hold of these promises and just lock into them like a bulldog. I always tell people, grab these promises and just lock on to them. He said those are the ones who are going to see the promises fulfilled. And so God doesn't put promises in the Bible for them not to work. And that's what is so exciting. When you see a promise in the Bible, it's, it's not there so you can say, oh, well, that would have been nice if it could have happened. God put that promise there for us to grab hold of it and put it to work because every promise in the Word of God that he's given to us, it's there for us to take and enjoy and put it to work and see the miracles that God has planned. Now, Luke 24, 44 tells us that everything written in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so I thought, Psalm 91, that's, that's a part of the Psalms. And so the Lord was showing me that anyone who will take this and believe it and put it to work, you know, I mean, it, it's yours. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miracle promise that God has given to us. Now, there's so many Christians who love God and they serve God faithfully, and perhaps they'll never even hear about this covenant, you know. But it's being offered to you to become a part of the remnant who has chosen to walk in it. And so when a person hears about Psalm 91, you can know you're a part of that remnant that he was talking about. So I'm going to challenge you tonight, if you haven't heard this before, grab hold of it now and walk in this victory because uh, 
it, it, it's beginning to spread around the world. Now, this covenant is a protection from God that will cover you. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be at home. You can be abroad. You can be in a place where it's really dangerous or sitting in your living room. It's a promise. Uh, and if you're in the will of God and you won't turn loose of this promise, we've, just, we've seen miracles happen. We have people write to us literally every day telling their miracle stories from, from this Psalm 91 covenant. Now, next to your salvation experience, next to your ticket to heaven, I can promise you that this is going to be one of the most important messages that you'll ever hear to put to work in your life and cover your children and your grandchildren. And if you'll believe it and if you'll walk in it, you know, uh, it's yours. It, it's such a beautiful gift from God, but it's not automatic. And so I'm talking about this Psalm 91 promise of protection now that God has made available to every one of his children who will just reach out and receive it, receive it by faith. But we have to know the promise first of all. We have to hear about it, know about it, and then start walking in it in order now for it to work. So it's been probably about 50 years ago that I was dealing with all kinds of fears. I, I was so frightened uh, that one of my family would get a disease or I was so frightened that something would happen to one of my children. And one Sunday morning, after getting really some distressing news, I was in my Baptist church then, and one of our beloved deacons had been diagnosed with uh, leukemia. They, they were giving him like maybe two months to live. And I remember coming home and praying and saying, Lord, is there any way to be protected from all of the things that we see coming on the earth? You know, I mean, there were so many diseases, so many accidents. And I said, God, is, is that possible? Or do we just sort of develop a case of rah, rah attitude and just say, well, whatever will be, will be, you know. And uh, I was really thinking, okay, maybe that's what we're supposed to do, you know. And I remember lying back across the bed and falling immediately to sleep, only to wake up just a short five minutes later. But in that five minutes, I'd had a very unusual dream. It, it was definitely a supernatural dream. In the dream, I was out in this open field, and I was asking the same question in my dream. I was saying, Lord, is there any way to be protected from all the things that we see coming on the earth? Or do we just, uh, just take it as it comes and not worry about it? And in the dream, I heard these words, in your day of trouble, call on me and I will answer. Well, I didn't have any idea whether those words came out of the Bible or whether it was just spoken to me, you know. But when I heard those words, the ecstatic joy that came bubbling up out of my innermost being, I tell you what, was beyond anything that I could possibly describe. And suddenly, to my surprise, in the dream, I'd been there alone speaking to God. And in the dream, I looked and the field started filling up with people. And all of a sudden, I turned around and I looked to both sides and I looked behind me. And as far as I could see, people were being added and added. And all of us were thanking God and we were praising God and we were clapping and jumping and thanking God for the, this promise, you know. Well, when I woke up, I knew I had the answer. It was like peace just flowed all over me. And uh, I, I knew the dream was supernatural. I knew it wasn't a normal dream. But I wasn't quite sure exactly what the answer was. And I, I was so excited, my feet didn't even touch the floor the rest of the day. I was just so excited because I, I knew God had spoken to me so supernaturally, you know. But it wasn't until the next day that I heard the word Psalm 91 just referred to on a tape. It was by Shirley Boone. Now, some of you, you're not going to know who Shirley Boone is, Pat Boone's wife. But those of you that are a little bit older, <laughs> you know, uh, Shirley Boone was mentioned Psalm 91. And then she said, oh, no, that's not, that's not the psalm I'm looking for. And she went on. But when I heard the word Psalm 91, it was like something exploded on the inside of me. And I just, I jumped straight up, you know, and I knew that <clears throat> this was God's answer to me. Now, I didn't have any idea what was in that psalm. You know, this is 50 years ago, and I didn't know my Bible very much at all. But I knew that if it told me to go stand on my head in the corner, I knew it was going to work. I knew that. I mean, it was just like, I felt like something was bursting on the inside of me. And I nearly tore my Bible up trying to turn to Psalm 91 to see what it had to say. And there in verse 15 was the exact statement that God had spoken to me in my dream. You know, and I could hardly believe my eyes. There was Psalm 91, verse 15. He will call upon me in his day of trouble and I will answer. Y'all, I, I can't, I, thank goodness I was at home by myself because I was jumping and clapping and, you know, just going crazy. And uh, uh, 
I, I realized all of the events that had led me up to finding this Psalm 91, I knew those were just as miraculous, that God had done an absolute miracle. And like I say, for days there, I nearly had a runaway. Now, this psalm can literally save your life. And uh, uh, all these, uh, we have uh, testimonies come in practically every day. We have testimonies come in of people who have put this to work, and they want to tell us their miracle of how God used it and, and did just unbelievable things in their life. And that's why this message is so important. That's why I love teaching it. I love for people to grab hold of it and, and realize it really works. You can put it to work in your life. Now, some of you have your Bibles, but if you do, we're going to start and go straight through this psalm because this is a gift offered to you by God himself. Now, like I say, I'm going to be using the New American Standard. Verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Have you ever been inside a house and you had a big fire going on in the fireplace and while you were all cozy and dry, while you watched this huge electrical storm going on on the outside? And you just had this warm feeling on the inside because you knew that you were sheltered from that storm. You knew that no matter how much it went on outside, you were in a safe place. And, and no matter what, you were out of reach and you were safe. Okay, that's exactly what this psalm is all about. We may be in a world where there's a huge storm going on on the outside. But when you truly take this and put it to work in your life, you're going to find out it's like you know that you're just in this safe place with the Lord. And, and this protection. Now, there may be times when he tells you something to do or, uh, you know, but, but when we're obedient and when we keep trusting him and we make this our covenant with God, it's amazing the miracles that God brings about. Did you know that there is a place in God, there's a secret place for God's children who want to seek refuge in him? We have to want that refuge. We have to, to seek that refuge and say, Lord, you know, I, I want this. I'm after this. Uh, and it's an actual place of physical safety that we're talking about. And God tells us about it in this psalm. And this is a secret place, but it's literal. And it's also conditional. So there's some conditions that we have to live up to. And we find out that here in verses 1 and 2, this is our part of the covenant. And uh, uh, he gives us our part of the covenant before he even mentions his part because our part has to come first. And uh, in order to abide now in the shadow of the Almighty... <clears throat> we're going to have to choose to say, Lord, I'm going to dwell in you. I want to dwell in you. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And so I started praying and asking God, Lord, you know, how do I dwell in the shelter of the Most High? I knew this was all supernatural, how God had given it to me, but I, I didn't know how to put it to work. And so I was just questioning, Lord, show me how to do this. Now, this is more than an intellectual experience. It's more than, than an emotional experience. Those are things that were wonderful. We love the emotional getting close to God. But it's more than that. This verse is speaking of a dwelling place in which we can be physically protected if we run to him. Now, you may utterly believe that God is your protection and your refuge. Uh, and you may have given mental assent to it all of your life. But unless we actually get up and run to this shelter, to this Psalm 91 protection, we're never going to really experience it. It has to be something where we make it ours, where we actually move into it. We dwell in his shelter by believing that he is a literal place of refuge, believing that his word is a place where we can be physically protected when we're willing now uh, to run to him in faith and to stay under that protection. Now, this place of refuge, I felt like the Lord told me that it was, it was a love walk with him. It's what it is. Because, see, it's a relationship with the Father where he literally becomes <coughs> our very best friend. Where, where he's our, we can be alone with him, we can be in the middle of a crowd, and, and we just have this secret knowledge that God's right there. That he's the one that's loving us and taking care of us and protecting us no matter where we are. And... Uh, I love it when just to drive down the road when I'm driving by myself and just know he's right there with me and just having a talk with him, just a love walk with the Lord where I don't even want the radio on. Turn the radio off. I just want to have time with the Lord. And some say, well, I don't have that kind of relationship with God. Well, I'm going to tell you what. When God gave me Psalm 91, I didn't have that kind of relationship with the Lord either. It's something that has to be developed where every day we start saying, okay, Lord, I don't even know how to get there but I want to get there. I want this kind of love walk with you and begin welcoming the Holy Spirit and saying, God, I don't, I don't want to face this day without you. It, it, it's supernatural, but when you ask for it, God is more than willing to reach out and, and just grab you up. 
Uh, some people take a, a walk every morning. I like to take a walk or get alone uh, somewhere where I can get alone with the Lord. Because do this every day. You'll never be sorry once you get this habit developed where you get alone and you start quoting Psalm 91 back to the Lord in a prayer of thanksgiving. Where you're not just quoting the psalm, but you're saying, Lord, I choose to dwell in your shelter. I want to be right there with you. I, I want to feel your presence around me. And go through the psalm, making it a personal covenant between you and God. And some people think, well, they can do it once and then every six months do it. No. It needs to be every morning where you develop that love walk, where you develop that knowing down on the inside of you that Psalm 91 is a very personal thing that God has given to you that's going to protect you while you're living in this world. Because there's a lot of mess going on in this world. But we can be protected in the middle of it. I have a saying when it comes to my health and my protection. And I always tell the Lord, Lord, I put all my eggs in one basket and you're the basket. <laughs> I don't have a plan B. And that's where we have to come. <clears throat> Where, where we realize God is our protection. You know, all of our eggs in that one basket. Okay, verse 2 tells us, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Okay, verses 1 and 2. Now, that's our part of the covenant. And I want you to notice that verse 2 in the New American Standard says, I will say. You need to circle that word say because we need to verbalize that trust out loud. Up until I, I was given this Psalm 91, I would think my prayers, you know, I would get up and I'd say my prayers in my head, you know, that's not good enough, you know, throw that out. It's not good enough just to think it. God says that we need to start saying these things with our mouth. The scripture says we have to say it. And I don't know what it is, but there's something about saying it now that releases power in the spiritual realm. I want you to notice what begins to happen to you on the inside when you start saying, Lord, you're my refuge. Oh, God, you're, you're my God. You're the one in whom I trust. It's in you that I put my total trust. Lord, I don't know what I would do without you. And when you start telling him and, and talking to him out loud, and the more we say that out loud, the more confident we start becoming in the fact that he's going to be there and he's going to protect us. Now, so often we're in mental agreement that the Lord's our refuge. I can remember for years, you know, if you had said, is God your refuge, is he is your protection? I would have said, of course, you know. You know and, I, and I would have thought I meant it. But uh, because so many times we think, yeah, I, I believe that. But we're going to find out that's not good enough. God's wanting us to take another step deeper into his spirit. And it needs to be something that wh when you've said it and you've come into it, something sort of ignites on the inside of you. Let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to touch enough bases to protect yourself from all the bad things that could happen? You ever tried to touch all those bases, get plenty of insurance, you know, make sure you have a good doctor, you know, you, you think of all these things you need to do. And it's like trying to keep the whole law. And God knew we couldn't do that. God has to be the one to whom we run first. I'm not saying he won't use a doctor. I'm not saying he won't use insurance at times. But he needs to be who we run to and let him direct then uh, our protection. He's the only one who has an answer for whatever might come. You know, he's, he's the only one that knows. I can't know what I'm going to be facing, and neither can you. But God knows, and if we're looking to him, if he's our source, then whatever it is that we're facing, he's, got a, he's going to have an answer for us. We dwell in his shelter by faith based strictly on what he did on the cross. Now, we have to stay close to him because we're going to find out when we don't, Self-will starts inching its way in, even a little bit of rebellion here and there. And what that does, it keeps us out of the secret place. That needs to be what we guard against. Lord, we, we don't want self-will. We don't want rebellion in our life. Now, our part of the covenant, like I say, it was expressed in verses 1 and 2. Because as we allow him to be the Lord of our life, then all of a sudden we're going to find out that his power is released to bring about all the promises in verses 3 through 16. You know, our part's not much, but it has to happen first, and then he brings in his part. Okay, I want us to look at God's part. In the first part of verse 3, it says, For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. Now, as hard as we may try, we're never going to be able to deliver ourselves now from the snare of the trapper. We're just not going to. It's God who's going to be able to deliver us. The Bible tells us that deliverance by man is in vain. Then It just won't do any good when we try to do it in our own strength. Okay, what does snare of the trapper actually mean? That's one of the first things I ask the Lord. You know, you said you deliver me from the snare of the trapper. What is the snare of the trapper? Well, the snare of the trapper is just a graphic way 
Now, I'm talking about the enemy. It's talking about Satan. Have you ever been into a movie and uh, maybe there was a fur trapper who went deep into the cold, cold mountains and uh, he baited these big steel traps, covered them over with leaves, and then he waited for some unsuspecting animal to step into one of those traps. And the Lord reminded me of, of movies that I'd seen like that. Well, those traps were not there by happen chance. I tell you what, that trapper had taken great care to place those traps in very strategic locations in order to catch the animal. Well, that is a perfect picture of exactly what the enemy does to us. And that's why he's called the trapper. Those traps are set, and they're not there by accident. They're, they're custom-made and baited specifically for each one of us because the enemy knows just exactly what would most likely hook me, you know, and he knows exactly what would most likely hook you. He knows just exactly the right thought or the right fear to put in my mind, and he knows just exactly what to, to bait you with. And God says, I'll show you where those traps are hiding if you'll trust me. That's where when we're in, in unity with God, that secret place of the Most High, he'll, he'll start telling us what those traps are so that we can watch for them. And the last part of verse 3, it says he will uh, deliver you from the deadly pestilence. Now, I always thought that a pestilence was something that attacked crops. I thought it was like bugs and grasshoppers and spider mites and all that, you know. Well, after doing a word study on the word pestilence, I found, to my surprise, that pestilence attacks people, not crops. And that word pestilence is any fatal epidemic now that hits the masses of people, any deadly disease that attaches itself to a person's body with the intent to destroy that person. And... Um, the Bible tells us, God tells us, that he will deliver us from that deadly disease that comes with the intent to destroy. That's quite a promise. God doesn't put promises in the word for us to say, well, that's nice, you know. No, if he puts a promise in the word and we'll put forth the effort to, uh, to be obedient and believe that promise, we're seeing miracles, unbelievable miracles happen because God's promises in his word, they're there for us to take and receive. Uh, but do we as Christians, do we even consider what some of these promises are saying to us? Sometimes I think we just read right over the promises and we don't even pay attention to what he's saying. But do we have the courage to believe God's word enough to know that he means these things literally? God's word is literal. When he makes a promise, it, it's, it's real. If We'll take it and put it to work. And then let me ask you this. Is it possible for this covenant to be true and yet uh, some people still miss out on the promises? We see a lot of people missing out on the promises of God. We're going to find out that only those who believe God and continue to hold fast now to his promises, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how hard the attack, somebody that will grab hold of those promises and not turn them loose, those are the ones who are going to see the promises fulfilled. But nonetheless, it is available. Okay, now in the, in the first part of verse 4, it says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. Did you notice that it says, under his wings you may seek refuge. You need to circle that word. doesn't say that you will or that you'll continue to seek refuge. Again, it's up to us. He's letting us know that the, the wings are there. The promise is there. But it says uh, uh, it, it's for those who will seek refuge under those wings, who determine they're going to seek refuge there. Now, we can seek refuge under his wings, and we can stay there, but it has to be a choice. It has to be something that we say... That's my promise, and I'm not turning it loose. Now, the Lord gave me a very vivid picture of what it means to seek refuge under his wings. My husband and I lived out in the country, and one spring, our old mama hen hatched out all these little baby chicks. And one afternoon, those little chicks were scattered all over the yard, and suddenly I saw the shadow of a hawk fly overhead. Well, my heart just sank because I thought, oh, those baby chickens are scattered in every direction, and I realized there was no way for that mama hen to get to them, get them all covered. And then I noticed something very unique that taught me a lesson that I'll never forget. That old mama hen, she didn't run to all those babies and jump on top of them, you know, and cover them with her wings. She didn't do that, no. What she did, she squatted down, she spread out those wings, and she began to cluck. And those little chickens from all over the yard, they came running to her and got under those outstretched wings. And when the last one got under, she pulled those wings down tight, tucking every little baby chick under her. And so I realized that hawk would have had to have gone through the mother to get to those babies. And God just said, that's what I've put in Psalm 91. He said, pay attention to what that's saying to you. 
When we think of those baby chickens running to their mother, we realize that it's under God's wings now that we may seek refuge. We, he doesn't say we will, but it's a choice. We may seek refuge there. And if we do, if we run to him, we're going to find out that he doesn't run here, there, and yonder any more than that old mama hen does. You know, he just said, I've made this protection available. He said, now you run to me. And he said, when you run to me and you get under my outstretched wings, the enemy literally would have to go through God to get to us. When you think about that, it just makes you want to shout, you know. And I thought, you know, God, what a comforting thought and what a beautiful illustration, you know, with that mama hen. Okay, and the last part of verse 4, it says, God's faithfulness is a shield. I want you to think about that. It's God's faithfulness to all of these promises that he's made that becomes our shield. And this word really is talking about a surrounding shield that goes all the way around us. And it's not just our faith, but it's our faith in his faithfulness. If it were just our faith, you know, we'd think, oh, can't, this, this doesn't work. But when we have faith in the fact that he's going to be faithful to these promises, all of a sudden you feel your faith begin to bubble up on the inside of you. And when we have faith in these promises and have faith in God's faithfulness to do what he promises, then that's when God says it literally becomes a shield around you. It encircles you. And when that happens, we become invisible to the enemy. God makes us invisible to the enemy. Okay, now the next two verses, verses 5 and 6, I love this. It contains <coughs> extraordinary promises. These two verses, and you need to write this out in the margin of your Bible, these two verses cover every evil known to man. And when God spoke that to me, I thought, that can't be. But the more I see, yes, every evil known to man will fall under one uh, of these four categories. There's two verses, four categories listed here. And I want us to look at these four categories one at the time. The first one is in the first part of verse 5. It says, you will uh, not be afraid of the terror by night. Okay, that includes all the evils that can come through another person. You know, the kidnapping, the, the robbery, rape, murder, terrorism, wars, things that come through another person. And so when we see that, we think, what a promise, you know. When we confess out loud that we're covered by the blood of Jesus and we start believing that, and, and we start confessing, Lord, this is one of your covenant promises that we don't have to be afraid of the terror. We don't have to be afraid of what comes through another person. Then the devil literally can't come in. Now remember that verse 2 tells us, I will say that the Lord's my refuge and he's my fortress. So it's heart and mouth. It's when you believe these promises with your heart and you start confessing them out your mouth. You can't just think it. You've got to confess it. Now most everyone has used a, a physical weapon at some point point in time, even if it's just a kitchen butcher knife, you know, you've used a physical weapon. Okay, I want to ask you this. Uh, our physical uh, weapons are operated with what part of our body? What are your physical weapons operated with? What part of your body? Your hand. Okay, your hand. Now, I want you to hear this because it's very important. What part of your body operates your spiritual weapons? It's your mouth. Always your mouth. The blood is applied by saying it. In fact, it's heart and mouth. He gives us that in Romans 10, 9 and 10. You believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth and it brings the results. Okay, um, it'll help you to, re if you'll remember that, it'll help you in operating your spiritual weapons. Always operate them with your mouth and it coming out of your mouth. You know, our daughter had a friend living in an apartment in Fort Worth and she was getting ready for church one morning, and someone knocked on her door. Well, she opened the door, thinking it was just a friend, and a man pushed his way in to molest her, and she started immediately, thank goodness, she had been taught. Uh, she started taking authority in Jesus' name. Well, in the natural, there was no way for a young girl inside of her apartment now to escape from a strong man. And that's what anyone would say. Oh, my goodness, she didn't have a chance. But she was so confident in her authority and she started confessing her promises in Psalm 91, you know. And it took 45 minutes now of spiritual battle. He would come at her time after time. And when she just kept quoting the word, she said he would kind of get immobile and kind of lose his focus and kind of shake his head like, you know, what's going on, you know. And she finally was able to get around and escape out the door. Well, after he was caught, she found that he had sexually assaulted numerous young women. They, they had all these reports on him when he was finally caught. She was the only one in all of those women, she was the only one who has, had escaped without harm. 
and but she probably was the only one that was putting that word to work, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, so number one, it tells us we don't have to fear the terror of what another person can do to harm us. Okay, the second part, the last part of verse five, tells us you don't have to be afraid now of the arrow that flies by day. So this second category of evil is the arrow. Now an arrow is something that pierces our, our wounds. It can pierce our wounds spiritually, physically, you know, emotionally. Uh, and the arrow is sent to destroy us. That's what it's all about. Now arrows are deliberately sent by the enemy and they're meticulously aimed at the area in our life that will cause us the most harm. The enemy knows just exactly where to aim the arrow at me and where to aim it at you. And those arrows are not shot off at random. Uh, you know, those arrows don't just happen to hit their target. They're targeted toward the area in which we've not yet had our mind completely renewed to the word. And the enemy knows that, and that's where he will hit us. He doesn't hit me in my strong areas. He tries to hit me in the area where I'm, I'm still struggling, you know. Now, that arrow could be aimed at circumstances um, uh, where maybe we're still losing our temper. Or he'll aim at an area maybe uh, where we're still easily offended. Or sometimes the enemy will send an, area, an arrow in an area where we're still in rebellion. Or maybe we're still in fear. And very seldom, like I said, does the enemy ever try to attack us where we're strong. He's going to come at us where we're still struggling. And that's why we have to run to God. And when we do battle using our, our spiritual weapons, and by that I mean those promises coming out your mouth, because that's your weapon and you're using your mouth, those uh, arrows will not approach us. The Bible promises that. And it is amazing when you start saying what the Word of God says that those attacks will start falling away from you. Um, okay, and the, the, the first part of verse 6 then gives us our third category of evil that God names, and it's pestilence. He said, you'll not be afraid of the pestilence that stalks in darkness. Okay, now this is the only evil that God named twice, and I think that's important. Have you noticed that when a person or maybe a parent says something more than once, it's usually because he really wants to emphasize the point. He wants you to really hear it. Okay, I think that's what God was doing here. He knew the pestilence and he knew the fear, the heart attacks, the cancer, the, the diabetes. All these things are running rampant in our world. And in these end days now, he's trying to get our attention by, I think, repeating that promise. You do not have to be afraid of the pestilence, he's saying. And it's as though God were saying, well, I said it in verse 1, but did you really hear me? Just to be sure, I'm going to say it to you again in verse 6. You do not have to be afraid of these deadly pestilence, these deadly diseases. Now, our inheritance is not limited to what's been handed down to us genetically. You know, it's so, it upsets me so badly because a person will go in the doctor's office and he'll start looking at their history, you know. What runs in your family, you know? Well, we have to come to a place where we quit thinking about what runs in our, our family and, and trusting God. That's where our inheritance is coming from. That's contrary to the world, but Psalm 91 is contrary to the world, but it still works, you know. So our inheritance can be what Jesus provided if we'll just believe the word and start putting it to work in our lives. And it's something we practice. You start doing it, and, 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 and you do it every day. That's why it's so important every day to have that time where you go over your Psalm 91 covenant with God. I have a close friend. She, her name is Renee. She was diagnosed right before Christmas a number of years ago uh, with lupus in the advanced stages. And um, I've never seen anyone grab hold of Psalm 91 <laughs> like that lady and declare lupus uh, will not be able to work in my body. And uh, her kidneys and her liver began to shut down. They, they, t they gave her, uh, this was diagnosed in October and they told her she would not live to see Christmas. And for a while, it was one horrible report after another. I got to the point where I just dreaded calling her, you know, because uh, not that she, she was telling me what the word said, but I dreaded calling knowing what was going on in her life. Now, most people would have given in to the bad doctor reports. I mean, the reports were horrible. And the pain, she was in so much pain, she would pull herself off the bed and crawl to the restroom and then lie on the floor. Uh, her uh, her face turned a, a different color. There was so much heat in her face. And she would lie there with her face against the cold uh, ceramic tile uh, until she could crawl back to her bed. But she constantly was telling me, Psalm 91 is my covenant, and I'm not receiving anything less. 
And uh, so I would be encouraged when I got off the phone with her <laughs> instead of my encouraging her. But they even told her, that, she, like I say, that she wouldn't live to see Christmas. But um, she kept saying her Psalm 91, and she kept getting worse. I mean, every time I would hear from her, it was something more that the, the doctor was uh, confessing over her. But all of a sudden, gradually, things began to change. She's seen probably 15 or 18 Christmases now. She goes all over. Uh, she lives uh, up north. She goes all over preaching the gospel, you know. And uh, when her kidneys began to function, the kidney specialist called it a miracle. They have this documented. The blood specialist three times in his report said it's miraculous. He used those words. And all this is documented. There was a third doctor, and after studying the last test results on the blood, he said, I see no lupus working in your body. And I thought that was interesting. Those were the exact words that she had been saying to me. She said, lupus can't work in my body. And that was exactly what the doctor said. You know. So I'm telling you, this Psalm 91 works. It's literal. But I'm going to tell you what, sometimes we've got to stand. Sometimes the enemy's coming in like a, a ferocious lion, and we have to take his word. And like Renee, no matter how bad it was coming against her, she was having to say what God's word said. She was standing on the word. Okay, then the last part of verse 6 then gives the fourth category of evil, which is destruction. It says you'll not be afraid of the destruction that lays waste. Now, destruction takes in the evil over which mankind has no control. You know, things that we ignorantly call acts of God. I hate it when there's a tornado or a flood or, you know, or some kind of fire or car accident. They'll say, well, it was an act of God. Sometimes that'll be in your insurance policy. Not always mark it out, <laughs> you know. Uh, these things are not coming from God. This result is coming from the evil that's in the world, you know. One example that we have in, uh, in Mark 4, verse 39 if you'll remember, Jesus rebuked the storm, and it became perfectly calm. And what that was doing, it was demonstrating the fact that God was not the author of these things, you know. Otherwise, Jesus would never have contradicted his father by rebuking something that was sent by the father, you know. So we always need to look at the life of Jesus. That gives us the perfect picture of the father. And because he's the, the Bible says he's the exact replica of the father. Um, Okay, did you, do you realize that every extreme evil known to man is going to fall under one of those four categories? The terror by night, what another person can do to harm you, the arrows, the deadly assignments of the enemy, the pestilence, the deadly diseases, and destruction, the natural disaster. Everything will fall under one of those categories, and the amazing thing is that God has offered us deliverance from them all. He covered every one of them. We can't even fathom that with our natural mind. We, you know, we can't even wrap our mind around that. It's hard to even imagine a God who knew all these dangers and provided a safety from them before we, even, before we even knew we had a need. That's the kind of God that we serve. But what about the vast majority of people out there who don't believe, you know? Well, Romans chapter 3, verse 3 says, If some do not believe, will their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? And then the very next verse says, God goes on to say, May it never be not going to nullify. It says God's going to be found true even though every single man is found to be a liar. And then the next verse, verse 4 says, but you will be justified by what you believe and what you say with your mouth. There's that Romans 10, 9 and 10 again. What you believe with your heart and say with your mouth. And then verse 7, God himself said, a thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand is your right hand. That's literal. You know, there's going to be times, I tell you what, when you hear so many negative reports, you see so many needs going on around you, that it's going to feel overwhelming. And it's going to make you feel like you just want to throw in the towel and, and quit, you know. And, and you have to be careful and, and guard from that when you see all these things happening. It's kind of like Peter when he looked at the waves, you know, and, and he, he was doing fine until he looked at the waves and he started sinking. And that's why God is warning us, and he's saying, hey, I'm telling you, there's going to be 1,000 falling at your side. There's going to be 10,000 falling at your right hand. He said, recognize that. Be prepared for it. And many times we're going to find out good people fall, you know, and we're going to have to say, okay, I, I, I hate hearing that, but God, your word tells me something different. I've got to hang on to what your word says. So don't let it throw you. But now you're going to find out it's your choice. It's my choice. It's your choice. And he says, if you'll run to my shelter in faith, it will not approach you. That's our promise. But it's hard sometimes when you're looking around and there's so many things going on in the world. Now, these promises are not automatic, 
but we do not have to be one of the 10,000 who fall. And that's what he's telling us here. If our mind is renewed to the word of God, if we grab hold of this word and say, God, this is your promise, I'm grabbing hold of it. It doesn't, uh, it, it's not backed up with the world, but it's backed up with your word. We can receive anything that God has already provided. If you can find in the word of God where God has provided something, it can be yours if you'll receive it. Now, the secret is knowing that everything for which God has made provision is clearly spelled out in the word of God. It's defined in the word of God. If you can find where God has offered it, then you can have it. Uh, sometimes we have to contend for it, you know, and, and you have to hang in there, just like with Renee, where she had to, to stand against those symptoms. But faith is not a tool to manipulate God into giving you something that you want. A lot of people, uh, they use the word to, oh, God, I want this or I want that. No, faith is simply the means by which we accept what God has made available, what he's offering to us. And believe you me, he offers so much. All we have to do is just exercise our faith to receive all, all the glorious promises. You know, late one night, we turned our radio on just as a tornado was on the ground headed straight to where we live. We could see it. And um, we could see the REACT Club vehicle. It was parked at the, uh, on the road right below our house. And they were there uh, sending messages to the radio station. And uh, the funnel cloud on the ground, it was headed toward us. And so Jack quickly got the kids. They were still living at home at the time. And he got the kids outside with their Bibles. And uh, they were already in their pajamas. And had us circling the house, quoting Psalm 91 and taking authority over the storm. And uh, the sky was this real strange color. There was not a night creature making a sound. It was just totally silent, you know. Then suddenly the silence turned into a roar with torrents of rain just uh, coming down what seemed like bucketfuls instead of, uh, but right before that happened, right before the rain started, Jack said, I've got a piece. It's okay. And we went back into the house. And um, just as we got inside the house, we had the radio going and we heard the on location reporter. He had called the radio station and he was exclaiming over the air. He was almost shouting. He said, this is nothing short of a miracle. And he used the word miracle. He said, the funnel cloud south of the country club has suddenly lifted up and vanished into the clouds. And so I, I tell you, God's promises, they're true. They were. And sometimes we're having to face that tornado or face whatever's coming. And we, we, we've got to have this inside of us. We need to prepare our hearts to believe this so that when we're faced with something, we don't turn and run, you know. And um, I'll have to tell the end of that story. Angie was her first year in, uh, uh, in college. And when she got to uh, Howard Payne the next morning, the professor was, uh, it was before class started, and, and he was just leaned back against his desk, and he was asking them, what did you do when the tornado was sighted on the ground last night? A couple of them had found, um, uh, oh, what do you call it, uh, underground shelters. Uh, most of the kids in the dorm had pulled their mattress into the, the uh, shower stall, and they were covered with it. And so he got to Angie, and he said, Angela, what were you doing? And she said, well, my dad had us outside with our Bibles speaking Psalm 91 to the storm. <laughs> and she said that he just reached over and picked up his textbook, and he said, okay, if everybody will turn to page so-and-so. <laughs> he was not about to, <laughs> to talk about that. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was funny. Um, the verses 8 through 10 then says, You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High. You've made him your dwelling place. Therefore, no evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent or come near your dwelling place. Okay, God has just added a new dimension now to the covenant. He's given us the opportunity now to exercise faith, not only for ourselves, but also for the protection of our entire household. You know, it wouldn't be much fun if we just did it for ourselves, if we saw our family going the wrong direction. But he's letting us here uh, also confess this for our entire household. Ah, so that God is so good. Then verses 11 and 12, it says, For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their, in their hands, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Okay, this is one of the most precious promises of God, and he put it right here in Psalm 91. My sister and I were going up uh, the interstate. We were headed for a ladies' conference in Oklahoma, and um, uh, I was going to be the speaker. And so I had told her we stay right on this uh, this freeway all the way into Oklahoma City. 
And all of a sudden, she just turned off the turnpike. And I said, why did you turn off the turnpike? And she said, well, didn't you see that detour sign on the highway? Well, probably no more than two minutes after we turned off, there was a horrible car pileup right in the freeway in the very lane in which we had been traveling, you know. And we would have been right in the middle of the tragedy. And even if we hadn't been hurt, we was, still wouldn't have made it to our, uh, our conference. And so uh, I thought, you know, God does. He gives his angels charge over us. And we laughed. We said, uh, one of those angels must have held up a detour sign, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we went back and there was no detour sign, you know. <laughs> but I thought that was interesting. But in verse 13, it says, you will tread up on the lion, the cobra, the young lion, the serpent. You will trample them down. Okay, Psalm 91 suddenly takes us from the subject now of our being protected by him, and he begins to put emphasis on the authority that he's given to us as believers when we start using his name. Uh, there's not many stories that compare to the one that, uh, uh, about Alma. I don't really know how to pronounce her name, uh, R-A-Y-E-S, but uh, she was on a jeepney in the Philippines. Now, these jeepneys were... Uh, World War II um, jeeps that they made into public transportation now. And uh, so several people had gotten on. It was like getting on a, a bus. And when they got outside the city, one of the men on the jeepney, he had the driver stop, and he got off the, the, the jeep and shot the man that was sitting next to Alma. Well, when that happened, she, she was a brand new Christian. She jumped straight up, and she started quoting Psalm 91. I'm dwelling in the shelter of the Most High, and she would just go into town. And this is a true story, but it, it sounds pretty wild. But the gunman pointed the gun at her and pulled the trigger, and the gun didn't go off. And uh, the driver finally came to his senses. He was so shocked, but he came to his senses, and he took off as that gunman was still pulling the trigger. And they said when they got out of range, uh, the, the gun fired. And, uh, you know, I mean, God does such an believable things. I wish we had time tonight for Angela and Ann and, and um, uh, Stephanie to tell y'all just miracle things that have happened overseas. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it really is exciting. It really builds your faith. But we need to ask ourselves, am I confident enough in my authority that I could boldly declare in the face of an attack, I am in covenant with the living God. I have a blood covering over me that protects me from all harm. So in the name of Jesus, I command you to put that gun down if it happens to be someone that, that surprises you that way, or in the name of Jesus, I command you to let me go, or, or whatever, you know. Uh, just like we saw the little woman do in the movie, War, War Room, you know. Uh, but we need to ask ourselves, do I have that kind of confidence in the fact that God has given us that kind of authority? And too often we quote our protection when things are going well, but when a bad report comes, or maybe when danger comes, too often we completely forget our covenant and we run into our reasoning. Uh, we forget the very thing that God has given to us to use in the face of an attack. And uh, we're confident using it when everything's going fine. But when things um, get out of hand, that's when sometimes we completely forget <laughs> our covenant. We completely forget our promises. And so if we don't have that kind of courage to use our authority, then we need to take the time to meditate on the authority scriptures until we become confident in who we are in Christ Jesus. If you know you don't have that kind of authority, that you, or, or you haven't learned how to use that kind of authority, then take the time and start getting your authority scriptures and go over and over them so that when you face something, you're not running to your reasoning, you're, you're using what God has given you. Because at new birth now, we immediately had enough power placed at our disposal to tread upon the enemy without being, being harmed. But most Christians, they either don't know it or they just fa fail to use it. And that's why God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He says, my people are destroyed. Okay, verses 14 through 16 to the end of the psalm now. The psalm moves from talking in third person about God's promises to, to God speaking to us personally to declare promises in first person. Okay, the first part of verse 14 says, because he loved me. So God's making it very personal here, here. He's saying this works because he loves me. Okay, and these last three verses now, God gives seven promises. And we need to take special note uh, of the fact that these seven promises are reserved for those who love him. Now, I call these the seven bonus promises. There's a promise of deliverance. It's the first. Thank you so much. When I get paid the big bucks for. Yes, she does. 
and that job. Okay, uh, so what, from what is God going to deliver us? God is going to deliver us from every evil known to mankind, just like he says in verses 5 and 6. Every evil. Think about that. What promise, you know? Now, there may be a wait at times. I know people uh, who stood on the promises for a good while while they're waiting. Or sometimes we're told something to do. We have to be willing to be obedient. But don't ever give up on the promises. Kind of like Renee, you know, uh, with that lupus. I don't know many people that would have stood as long as she stood. And I think a lot of people go on home to be with the Lord and they think, well, it just didn't work. No, they just didn't stand long enough. Uh, Renee is a perfect example. Uh, you know, okay, the last part of verse 14, it says, I will set him securely on high. Okay, when we sit so securely on high, it's far above all these problems that's going on in the world. Now, this second bonus promise is, is made to those who love God and know him by his covenant name. Think about it. When we're seated on high, these things are under our feet. And we need to picture that and realize, Lord, I'm seated on high with you. These things are under my feet, you know. And then the first part of verse 15, he will call on me and I will answer him. Now, there are a lot of people who pray and they never expect God to hear them. You know, they're just saying words. A lot of people pray and, and they're not expecting an answer. They may believe God's hearing them, but they're not expecting an answer. So it becomes just ritualistic praying. We need to be careful that we don't get into just ritualistic. Uh, but God has made a third promise here that he will answer those who truly love him and call on his name. But we need to ask ourselves, do I believe that? Do I really believe what he's telling me here? My good friend, Jeanette Renfro, she was awakened from a deep sleep one night, and uh, she was our pianist at our church. And in a vision, see, she saw her son drowning. Now, he was on the other side of the world at the time, so it was daylight for him. And she started calling out to God, and finally she said in her vision, she saw him miraculously picked up out of the water, and she said he looked just like a, a drowned mouse. But she knew that the danger had passed, so she got up and she made an entry into her journal and then went back to bed. Well, it was several months later before he came home, and she told him about being awakened to intercede. And he said, Mother, I did have an almost uh, a, a near drowning experience. He said, It really nearly took my life. Well, when they looked it up in her journal, it was the exact day in which uh, it had happened that she had prayed. So if God wakes you up and tells you to pray... <laughs> Don't say, no, I'm too sleepy. <laughs> Get up and do your praying, you know. You may be saving somebody's life. Uh, the middle of verse 15, I will be with him in trouble and I will rescue him. Have you ever been in trouble and uh, had something that needed to be rescued? You know, one day we came home and we found out the car belonging to our two teenagers had been stolen out from under the carport. And God told us something that we'd never heard before. Uh, we usually stood on Psalm 91, you know, but this time he said, I want you to forgive whoever took that car. And we did, and we started confessing our Psalm 91 through tears at first because we needed that car. I tell you what, when you have two teenagers going to two different schools and your husband going to the work, one car just doesn't work. Uh, well, when the car had been gone for about a week, the sheriff told us, he said, I'm sorry, it's down in Mexico, it's got a different paint job, you can just forget that car, you know. But Jack said, no, we're not going to lay down our Psalm 91 covenant. Now, this is hard to believe, but this is true. One week later, a man turned himself in, and uh, he wasn't caught. He turned himself in, and uh, the, uh, uh, one of the guys from the sheriff's department drove him out to our house, and he said, I had stolen all of my life, but this was the first time I ever felt guilty. And he said, I didn't like how it felt. And I thought, hmm, maybe that's why God told us to forgive him. <laughs> so he was free to, you know, to feel that guilt. Well, Jack took him in the other room and led him to the Lord. And then he said, where's our car? You know, somebody had to bring him out. And he said, well, I tell you what, I was so drunk that night. He said, I do not remember where I left that car. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but we were thinking, oh, my goodness. We found the man and we still don't have a car, you know. And he said, I vaguely remember being at a rodeo. He said, I think I was at a rodeo. Well, Angela, she and a friend went over. Uh, oh, we started checking. There were, had been no rodeos in our town. We couldn't find a place who had had a rodeo. And finally, she's found one little um, Elm Grove, I think. Is that the name? Elm Grove? Anyway, uh, she found that. And they went over there. And there was our car on the parking lot. And... Uh, uh, I thought, you know, have you ever heard of a thief turning himself in and returning the car? 
at least he tried to return the car. And what was interesting, it was on empty when he took it, so he must have run out of gas. Because when they found the car, it was full of gas, and there was a can of gas sitting in the back seat. He wasn't going to run out of gas again. <laughs> Okay, the fifth promise then is in the last part of verse 15. Because he loves me, God says, I will honor him. You know, we love being honored by man. But it's really something when you think about it when, when God honors you, when God says, I'll honor you. And he honors us, think about it, by calling us his children. You know, he honors us uh, when we take his promises and his word seriously. So start noticing the different ways in which God honors you. He honors us so many times that we don't even pay attention. The first part of verse 16 says, With a long life I will satisfy him. So the sixth promise to those who love God is a satisfied long life. God doesn't just say, I'll prolong your days and give you a lot of birthdays. He said he will satisfy us with those, with those birthdays. Now there are people who would testify that just having a great many birthdays would not necessarily be a blessing. But that's why I think it, this is such a beautiful promise that he says, I'll give you a long life, but you'll also be satisfied in, in, as you live it out. I had a lady who was about to have her 100th birthday, and she called me. She lived up north, and she called me, and she said she wanted to buy a case of Psalm 91 uh, books. And I said, what are you going to do with a case of Psalm 91 books? Because she was 100 years old. And uh, she said, I'm going to have a birthday party, and I'm going to hand them out at my birthday. I thought, that's a long, satisfied life. <laughs> I thought that was a good testimony. <laughs> and then the seventh promise in the last part of verse 16 is that he will allow those who love him to behold his salvation or to take hold of his salvation. Now, there are a lot of people who are surprised when they look up the word salvation and that it, they find that it has a lot deeper meaning than just a ticket to heaven. A lot of people think of salvation just their ticket to heaven. But salvation in the Hebrew and in the Greek means health, healing, deliverance, protection, and provision. Wow. Think about that, you know. And God wants us to reach out and take hold of him in all of those areas. Okay, I'm going to end with one last story that's just too good not to share it. <laughs> um, have you ever been loading your car and you put something maybe like your purse or your cell phone or something up on top of the car? I've done that before. And then you jump in your car and... Oh, my goodness, it's such a disappointment when later you realize that you lost it somewhere down the road. And, um, uh, some, and most of the time, that's a pretty expensive mistake. Well, there's nothing as bad as what happened. Uh, a friend, Donna Newsom, she recently saw this in heavy Dallas rush hour traffic. So I want you to picture where she was. In horror, she realized that there was a baby in an infant seat perched on the top of the station wagon right in front of her. And she said when she saw that, she said literally, it, it took her breath away. And she said she started screaming the name of Jesus and started screaming portions of Psalm 91. Uh, she, that was just, she was just screaming it out loud. And then she said just about that time, the station wagon sped up and made a left turn. And she said as it made the left turn, that emphasis started sliding across the, uh, the, the top of the car and started flying through the air. She said there was traffic everywhere. And she said it just went off the top and it was just flying through the air. And she says horns were honk honking in every direction. And uh, she said it was just like a slow motion nightmare, uh, watching that baby propelled through the air. And uh, she said the, the car seat hit the pavement right side up. And she said it bounced. And then she said it skidded for a long way and came to a stop. She said Donna said she slammed on her brakes because she was directly behind uh, that car. She said she flew out of the car at a dead run to get to the baby. And she said cars were squealing to a stop in every direction, you know, to keep from, uh, from hitting the baby. She said her heart was beating out of her chest. And she said then she saw the miracle. She said that carrier had landed right side up. She said when she got around it, the baby's little fat legs were just going 90 miles an hour. She said, and she said it was grinning, and she said the whole front was just wet where it had drooled <laughs> so much. She said that baby must have thought this is the most exciting ride I've ever had. <laughs> and she said about that time, she heard this woman yelling, my baby, my baby, and came screaming and crying. And, uh, of course, the mother had discovered that was her baby, you know. And she said she glanced over at the lady's car, and there were several wide-eyed faces of little brothers and sisters staring out the car. And now Donna's a nurse, and so she began checking that baby, she said, from head to toe uh, for injuries. She said there was not a single scratch on that baby. 
And the mother, of course, just fell in Donna's arms. She was just sobbing <laughs> to relief. You can imagine. Uh, I can't even imagine what that mother went through. Uh, but she said in moments there were ambulances and police cars coming. And she said when they got to the emergency room doctor, he took the baby in, examined it, she said, for a good while. And then he came out. She said he was shaking his head in unbelief. And he said, you know, I can't believe this. He said, there's not a scratch on that baby. Okay, what were the chances that a baby would survive being hurled into traffic? You know, what were the chances that the empty seat would land right side up and skid to a stop? You know, what were the chances that all those cars would be able to scatter and none of them hit the baby? She said there was not one single wreck. There were no car pileups, you know, not even a fender bender. And she said that as she headed home that day, she said, Father, I thank you that I have seen Psalm, that Psalm 91 covenant working at the very best. <laughs> she was so excited. But God has offered us Psalm 91 to be in our life for days like this. And all of us are going to have some days like this. Maybe not a baby on the top of the car, but we're going to have days like this. And um, my mind cannot even c comprehend a God who loved us enough to make this kind of covenant to protect his children from every evil known to man. When you think about it, he covered everything. You can't come up with, with a need that you can have that's not covered somewhere in this psalm. And um, I, I just, I love teaching this because I, I just want people to grab hold of it. We've seen so many miracles. We've seen, we've had so many testimonies come in to our ministry. Uh, every time we write a new Psalm 91 book, we, we've written them for little children, we've written them for teenagers, we've written for mothers, and we put new testimonies in them of people sending their testimonies in. I said, we've got to write some more books because all these testimonies coming in, we've got to, uh, to be able to publish them. But Father, I say thank you, Lord, for this Psalm 91 covenant. Father, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. Father, nothing makes me happier than uh, to be able to share this and, and have people put it to work. Father, I know there's times when we really have to stand and we have to not turn loose of it because sometimes uh, the enemy challenges it and makes it uh, appear that it's not working. But, Father, when we hang in there, it always works. Sometimes we have to wait a while. Sometimes there's something we, you tell us to do. But, Father, your word always works. It is a promise that you've given to us simply because you love us so much. Now, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come and meet these precious people and, and share this. And I know that many of them already are practicing the Psalm 91 covenant. They're already putting it to work. Father, I just pray that you'll encourage them, keep them going. If there happens to be someone here that's never heard it before, I pray that you'll cause it to just burst inside of them. I remember the, what it felt like when it just burst inside of me. And I thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough that even though we're living in a, a fallen world, Father, if we grab hold of you, and we don't turn loose, Father, grab hold of your word, Father, you are so faithful. You didn't leave us orphans. We so, we're so grateful, Father. I ask a special blessing, Father, on every single person that's here. We say thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Back up.